Welcome to Volume 1 of the Princeton Review's Word Smart Vocabulary Building Program. You're going to increase your vocabulary by at least 50 words. Although you may not be familiar with them now, these words are not particularly difficult or esoteric. Our goal is to give you useful, powerful words that show up every day in a variety of contexts, from newspapers to movies, from corporate memos to your favorite novels and television shows. Not only will you get more from your reading, you'll also be able to communicate more effectively. The words you use say a lot about you. We're going to help you learn vocabulary that says you're smart, persuasive, and informed. Here's how our system works. We'll break down the word list into topic groups. You'll find it's easier to remember new words in the context of a larger group of similar words than it is to memorize an arbitrary list. You'll also find that many words with similar meanings also have similar roots, prefixes, and suffixes. That is to say, the basic building blocks of the words show up repeatedly. That way, if nothing else, you'll become familiar with those building blocks and you'll be able to crack open the meanings of countless numbers of words. Each group of words is broken into complementary halves. For example, one group might be called hot and cold. That group has two parts to it, so we'll examine each half individually. First hot, then cold. Then, when both halves have been covered, We'll review the group as a whole and mix things up a bit. You'll be hearing word lists and definitions, as well as stories and speeches highlighting the words, all in rather quick succession. But this is your course to listen to and absorb at your speed. So whenever you feel like listening to a section again, by all means do so, as often or as little as you like. We're certainly not going anywhere. Without further ado, then, let's get started with the first group of words. All right, here we go. The first group of words all fall under the heading of all or nothing. We'll be covering words that describe quantities, both large and small. Let's start by looking at the all words, words that mean a lot. Okay, here we go. Prodigious. Prodigious means enormous or extraordinary. To fill the Grand Canyon with ping pong balls would be a prodigious undertaking. It would be both extraordinary and enormous. If I may point out here, there are a prodigious number of words that begin with the prefix pro. That's certainly true. As we'll see, many of those words have very similar meanings. And even when their meanings differ, that prefix has the same effect. It almost always signifies the notion of a large amount of something. Also, it can mean for something, as in in favor of. Then the connection between these next two words makes a lot of sense. Prodigious sounds a lot like prodigy, which means an extremely talented child. For example, the young prodigy played all of Beethoven on her harmonica. This prodigy has prodigious talents. Exactly. Pro has the same effect on both of those words. The same is true of this next word, prolific. Prolific means producing a lot of something. It can also mean fruitful or fertile. A prolific writer writes a lot of books. Picasso was both a prolific painter and a prolific lover. He created thousands of paintings and had almost as many romantic affairs. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, prolific sounds very much like proliferate, which means to spread or grow rapidly. That's because they're connected. They are? Yep. They share the same roots, and you can see how their meanings are alike. Yes, I see. Good. So shall we continue? Why not? We were on proliferate, right? Honeybees, for example, proliferated when we filled our yard with flowering plants. Or, the recent arms treaty promises an end to decades of nuclear weapons proliferation. After something has been allowed to proliferate for long enough, when you have a whole lot of something, good or bad, you have a plethora. A plethora is an excess. Try this. Letting the Air Force use our backyard as a bombing range created a plethora of problems. Or, of course, by becoming familiar with the prefix pro, one can better understand the meanings of a plethora of words. A person who has a lot of something, one could say a plethora, should be, if they're nice, munificent. That is to say, they like to give their stuff to others. They're generous or lavish. Take this sentence, for example. The munificent millionaire gave money to practically every charity that came along. He was well loved for his munificence. That same millionaire, however, might also squander huge amounts of money on worthless items just to satisfy his fragile ego. Squander means to waste. This guy's been known to squander millions on ping-pong balls. He wants to fill the Grand Canyon with them. 
What a waste! Squander. Aggregate means the sum total, a collection of things mixed together. This section of WordSmart, for example, is an aggregate of different words that all describe large amounts of things, and what can happen to or be done with large amounts of things. And following this final word will be a list which is an aggregate of the words we just learned. Here it is. Prodigious. Enormous or extraordinary. Prodigy. A gifted child. Prolific. Very productive or fruitful. Proliferate. To spread or to grow. Plethora. A great deal or an excess. Munificent. Generous or lavishly giving. Squander. To squander is to waste. And finally, aggregate. A combination or collection of things. Now we're going to put those words to practical use. You're about to hear a man describe his line of work. The job of organizing an international tour for a symphony orchestra isn't easy. There are countless tasks to attend to and a prodigious number of details. We're not a rich organization, so we depend largely upon the munificence of wealthy sponsors. Unfortunately, many potential sponsors look upon donations to the orchestra as a waste, just money squandered. But I try to convince them otherwise. Our orchestra is a collection of a wide variety of people. It's an aggregate of artists and managers. Unfortunately, with such a large number of people, such a plethora of personalities, fights are frequent. And it just gets worse as the season wears on. Arguments multiply, disputes proliferate. Our program on this tour will be devoted mostly to Mozart, who wrote hundreds of great pieces of music. He was one of the most prolific of all great classical composers. Like Mozart, our nine-year-old piano soloist is a world-renowned prodigy. She's very gifted, if not a little preoccupied by Saturday morning cartoons. Now let's take a look at the other side of the coin and learn those words which describe nothing, or at least not a lot. Here they are. If you have practically no money, you have a paucity of wealth. Paucity means scarcity, an insufficiency. A pauper, for example, has a paucity of cash, or the paucity of fresh vegetables at the market forced us to buy frozen ones. A word that means very close to the same thing as paucity is dearth. Dearth means lack or, like paucity, scarcity. For example, when there is a dearth of food, people will go hungry. Or you can turn it around like this. There is no dearth of comedy at the clown convention. The comedy is everywhere. A person who is living on a tight budget will look for items they can buy at a nominal cost. Nominal means insignificant or small, being named as a mere formality. The cost was nominal in comparison to what we received. Here's another. The rain, while a pain, had a nominal effect on our fun at the football game. We had a blast. Getting back to tight budgets, being frugal can be as much a quality of some wealthy people as it is of those without large fortunes. Frugal means economical or penny-pinching. Hannah's frugality annoyed her husband, who loved nothing better than to spend money. Furthermore, we were as frugal as we could be, but we still ended up several thousand dollars in debt. Someone who takes frugality too far could be called parsimonious. Parsimony means stinginess. Take, for example, the old widow who was so parsimonious she hung her tea bags out to dry on her clothesline so she'd be able to use them again. Well, perhaps it's just that she was alarmed by the attrition among the tea shops in her area. Attrition means a gradual loss or a natural and expected decrease in numbers and size. Single-sex colleges, the few that are left, have the highest rates of attrition among most colleges in America. Many speculate that the students leave to finish their education at schools with students of both sexes. And while we're on the topic of small amounts, let's look at minuscule. Sounding a lot like what it means, minuscule means very tiny. Sheila's skirt was so minuscule it could have passed for a belt. Or Arnold knew his father was exaggerating when he told him it would only take a minuscule effort to clean up his room. And finally, when you've got a minuscule amount of money, penury is the word for you. Penury means poverty. Having blown his lottery winnings on plastic kazoos, Mark was reduced to penury. He'd better get a job. Okay, that's it for the nothing words. 
Here's a quick list of the words for review. After this, we'll put them into the larger context of another life story. Paucity. A scarcity, an insufficiency. Dearth. A lack, a scarcity. Nominal. Insignificant or small. Frugal. Economical or penny pinching. Parsimony. Parsimony means stinginess. Attrition. A gradual expected decrease in numbers. Minuscule. Very, very small. Penury. Poverty. Here now is a life story that will contain the nothing words we just looked at. Our income here at the convent is so minimal, we are forced to live a life of penury. But even though we must watch every penny and be frugal almost to a fault, there is still room for charity. Just because we're poor doesn't mean we have to be parsimonious. Where do we get our money, you ask? Well, donations, of course. And we do ask those who wish to become a part of our convent for a small initiation fee. Just a nominal payment, really. So small, you might even call it minuscule. Actually, I shouldn't have even mentioned it, since we almost never get a chance to collect it anymore. You see, not only have our ranks grown smaller due to attrition, but there has also been a noticeable dearth of newcomers in recent years. Ah, oh, well, I suppose young people today just aren't tough enough for a life lacking ordinary comforts and a paucity of even the simplest material items, not to mention luxuries. There. Now we've covered both halves of all or nothing. To review, we'll mix things up a bit. During the pause that follows each word, try to fill in the definition. Then you'll hear an excerpt from the speech in which it appeared, followed by the definition, and finally, another example. Here are the words from all or nothing. Nominal. A small initiation fee, just a nominal payment. Nominal means insignificant or small, in name only. A nominal payment is almost none at all. Prolific. He was one of the most prolific of all great classical composers. Prolific is very productive or fruitful. Mozart wrote hundreds of pieces of music. He was prolific. Squander. Sponsors look upon donations to the orchestra as a waste, just money squandered. To squander is to waste. The sponsor didn't want to squander money. They can't afford to waste it. Plethora. Such a large number of people, such a plethora of personalities. A plethora is a whole lot, or excess. There's no plethora of rich people who want to give away their money. Attrition. Our ranks have grown smaller due to attrition. Attrition means a gradual decrease in numbers. There are fewer nuns now because of attrition. Minuscule. So small you might even call it minuscule. Something minuscule is very, very small. An atom is a minuscule particle. Prodigious. There are countless tasks to attend to and a prodigious number of details. Prodigious means very large, extraordinary. Building the pyramids was a prodigious task. Parsimony. Just because we're poor doesn't mean we have to be parsimonious. Parsimony. Stinginess. Don't be so parsimonious. Lend me a nickel. Munificence. We're not a rich organization, so we depend largely upon the munificence of wealthy sponsors. Munificence is generosity. I benefit from the munificence of my rich grandmother. Paucity. Young people today just aren't tough enough for a life lacking ordinary comforts and a paucity of even the simplest material items, not to mention luxuries. Paucity means a really small amount. I suffer from a paucity of vacation time. I'm always at work. Penury. Our income here at the convent is so minimal, we are forced to live a life of penury. Penury is another good word for poverty. Actors, like nuns, 
often live a life of penury. Aggregate. Our orchestra is an aggregate of artists and managers. An aggregate is a combination or collection of items, like this word list. Proliferate. Arguments multiply. Disputes proliferate. To proliferate is to grow or spread. My knowledge of words proliferates as I listen to Word Smart. Frugal. We must watch every penny and be frugal almost to a fault. To be frugal is to be economical. If you're low on cash, then you'd better be frugal. Dearth. There has also been a noticeable dearth of newcomers in recent years. A dearth is a scarcity or a lack. I suffer from a dearth of free time too. I'm also always at work. Prodigy. Like Mozart, our nine-year-old piano soloist is a world-renowned prodigy. A prodigy is an extremely gifted child. Anyone who is master of anything at a young age could be called a prodigy. That's it for all or nothing. Review the words by taking a look at their spelling on the enclosed insert card. And before we move on to the next group, let's talk briefly about mnemonic devices. A mnemonic device is any little trick you make up to remember something. The classic example, of course, is tying a string around your finger to remind you to do something. For example, the mnemonic I use to remember parsimonious is parsley. Parse makes me think of parsley, which is a very stingy meal if that's all you've got on your plate. Anyone who would serve you only parsley is parsimonious or stingy. It's generally best for you to make up your own mnemonic. You can use other people's, but you'll remember your own more easily. When you have a chance, review the words we've learned on the enclosed insert card. Look at their spellings and roots, and see what mnemonics you can come up with to remember those tough ones. Meanwhile, let's return to our word groups. Our next group of words are grouped under the category name "I love you, I hate you." As you can probably tell, these are words which talk about having affection for someone or something, as well as having feelings of dislike. Once again, we'll break down the group into its two natural halves and do each part separately. Which should we do first? How about "I love you"? You do? Well, I love you too, dear. Now, let's begin. First up in the "I love you" group is the word "revere." Einstein was a preeminent scientist who was revered by everyone, even his rivals. Revere is to respect highly, to honor. Picasso is revered as one of the greatest painters of the modern era. However, many people also feel that no one revered Picasso more than Picasso himself. One who loves him or herself deeply practices narcissism. In Greek mythology, Narcissus was a boy who fell in love with his own reflection. To engage in narcissistic behavior is to act like Narcissus. It would appear that we both share a predilection for references to Picasso. We both like to use him as an example. A predilection is a natural preference for something. Another example: Joe's predilection for saturated fats has added roughly a foot to his waistline in the last twenty years. Predilection. It seems that we have a confluence of ideas regarding certain issues. A confluence is a flowing together, especially of rivers, where they begin to converge or flow together. A confluence of many factors: good food, nice decor, and a swinging band made the party a huge success. All those things came together to make for a great time. Another good word that expresses closeness is affinity. Ducks, for example, have an affinity for water. That is, they like to be in it. Affinity means an attraction, sympathy, kinship, or similarity. Magnets and iron have an affinity for each other. They are attracted to one another. When you're generally feeling good about something or someone, you approach it or them with alacrity. For instance. David could hardly wait for his parents to leave. He carried their luggage out to the car with great alacrity. Alacrity is a cheerful eagerness, briskness, or readiness to respond. Alacrity sounds a lot like enthusiasm. Well, in fact, they're quite similar. And finally, a word that describes a whole lot of love, adulation, which means wild or excessive admiration. The rock star soon grew tired of the adulation of his fans. There is a note of insincerity in adulation. As there is in flattery, I'll try and bear that in mind. It would certainly be prudent of you. Prudent? Yes, prudent. 
It means having foresight, being careful or wise. For example, Joe is a prudent money manager. He doesn't invest heavily on horse races and puts only a small part of his savings in the office football pool. Joe is the epitome of prudence. So, is that an I love you word or an I hate you word? Neither. It's just a good word to know. Show some foresight. Be prudent. Simply learn it for its own sake. Consider it learned. Prudent. Once again, we'll give you a quick list of the words. Then you'll hear the I love you words put to use in a speech. Revere. To respect highly or to honor. Narcissism. An abiding love of oneself. Predilection. A natural preference. Confluence. A flowing together. Affinity. An attraction or sympathy towards something. Alacrity. A cheerful eagerness or readiness to respond. Adulation. Wild or excessive admiration. Prudent. Careful or having foresight. All of my life I was drawn towards the halls of academia. I can't really remember a time when I did not display a strong predilection for scholarly work. Unlike most of my high school friends who hated having to do schoolwork, I inevitably approached even the driest of my assignments with great eagerness and alacrity. And whereas my friends were worshipping the popular icons of their day, the Beatles, Janis Joplin, and Bob Dylan, I had come to revere the likes of Margaret Mead, Oscar Wilde, and Isaac Asimov. The writings of great thinkers from all disciplines flow together in my mind, and this confluence inspired me to pursue my studies. So while my wildly admired friends who excelled at sports enjoyed the adulation of practically every student, I was reading alone in the library. I spent so much time amidst books, in fact, that my affinity for the written word became something of a campus legend. And because I was so often content to be alone, many thought that I loved no one but myself, and I was often called narcissistic. Now that we are all grown, however, individual interests are no longer frowned upon. I have gained the respect of my peers. Now it's time to cover the second half of the group, I love you, I hate you. Well, we've finished I love you, so naturally it's time for... I hate you. Well, if you really feel that way, then let's waste no time and get started. The following are words that express feelings of dislike or unhappiness. These feelings can be directed toward other people or things or situations. Here are the words. Why don't you begin? All right. The first word is acrimonious. This is an adjective that describes feelings of bitterness and spitefulness. For example, George and Elizabeth's discussion turned acrimonious when Elizabeth introduced the subject of George's infidelity. One can understand how those feelings might develop when people are just plain mean to one another. Acrimonious arguments are sure to result when bitterness rules a relationship. Also, acrid means bitter, stinging, or caustic, so clearly there's a connection to that root, acra. Indeed, acrimonious and acrid are both adjectives which mean similar things, but the difference depends on the usage. The two different words tend to apply to different subjects. When a relationship is characterized by acrimony, then it's safe to assume that there's an antipathy between the two parties. Pathy is the root that means feeling, and it shows up in a large number of words from sympathy to empathy. When the prefix anti, which means against, is tagged on to the beginning of the root pathy, you get antipathy. Literally, that would translate as against feelings, but we translate it more simply as dislike. I feel antipathy towards bananas wrapped in ham. I do not want them for dinner. I also feel a certain amount of antipathy toward the chef who keeps trying to force me to eat them. My feelings on these matters are quite antipathetic. So strong are your feelings of dislike towards bananas wrapped in ham, one might go as far as to say that said bananas are the bane of your existence. Bane means poison, torment, or cause of harm. It literally means poison, as in wolf bane, which is a poisonous plant, but the word is usually used figuratively. My boss, for example, while not literally a poisonous entity, is nonetheless the bane of my every waking hour. His constant tormenting makes my life a misery. Anything that affects you in a poisonous way could be called a bane. 
Your boss is so awful because he unjustly derides your work. To deride is to ridicule or laugh at contemptuously. Barry derided Barbara's driving ability after their hair-raising trip down the twisting mountain road. Sports writers derided Columbia's football team, which hadn't won a game in many years. Or, of course, the boss derided his secretary mercilessly about her poor fashion choices. So she poisoned him. She was someone who could not accept derision. A good way to deride someone is to make derogatory comments about them. Derogatory is an adjective that means disapproving or, even better, degrading. Oliver could never seem to think of anything nice to say about anyone. Virtually all his comments were derogatory. It sounds like Oliver is not well loved. Perhaps he too was the victim of baneful derogatory remarks that turned him into a bitter person who was unable to love. His dislike of practically everyone and everything was so complete one could call him a nihilist. Nihilism is the belief that there are no values or morals in the universe. A nihilist doesn't believe in any objective standards of right or wrong. Nihilism is a combination of pessimism and skepticism taken to its farthest extreme. The nihil in nihilism is the same root of annihilate, which of course means to completely destroy. They both signify the essential nothingness that many people, most of them nihilists, believe is a fundamental characteristic of being alive. Well, this certainly is a depressing group of words. I'd like to keep moving. A good idea. Let's try rancor. This is a good one. Jeremy's success produced such feelings of rancor in Jessica, his rival, that she was never able to tolerate being in the same room with him again. Rancor is a noun that means bitter, long-lasting ill will or resentment. How about the mutual rancor felt by the two nations eventually led to war? To feel rancor is to be rancorous. The rancorous public exchanges between the two competing boxers are strictly for show. Outside the ring, they are the best of friends. And finally, when you speak badly of someone, when you assassinate their character, you vilify them. To vilify is to say vile things about, or to defame. Vilify sounds a little like villain. That's how I remember what vilify means. It means to turn a person into a villain. Also, the word vile or horrible is in there too. Here's an example. Our taxi driver paused briefly on the way to the airport in order to vilify the driver of the car that had nearly forced him off the road. The political debate was less a debate than a vilification contest. At first, the candidates took turns saying nasty things about each other, then they stopped taking turns. All right. Now that we've covered the I hate you words, we'll quickly review them. Here's the list. Acrimonious. Bitter, hurtful, and nasty. Acrid. Bitter, stinging, or caustic. Antipathy. A firm dislike. Bane. A torment or poison. Deride. To ridicule or laugh at contemptuously. Derogatory. Disapproving or degrading. Nihilism. A belief that there are no morals and no goodness in the world. Rancor. Bitter, long-lasting ill will or resentment. Vilify. To say vile things about or to defame. Here now is a man who will describe himself and in the process put these words to use. I live in darkness. Sunlight, which would kill me, is the bane of my existence. So is garlic. And while I am truly a messenger of evil, and I do lay waste to countless innocent victims. There is no reason to say the sorts of vile things about me that people tend to do. Do not vilify me thusly. Nasty put-downs and derogatory remarks are no way to prevent me from having my way and doing as I will. In fact, if you ridicule me and deride my character too much, you might find yourself in a bit of hot water. You'll regret having fostered any feelings of dislike or antipathy between yourself and me. And after I've enjoyed the nectar from your tender, tasty veins, you'll also find you've lost all faith in the goodness of mankind. You shall be a supreme nihilist, your outlook on life grim and hopeless. So, do your best to please me and prevent our relationship from becoming ugly and bitter. 
When things grow acrimonious between myself and other people, other people always pay, dearly. On the other hand, if you're nice to me, and we avoid the rancor that so often prevents people like you and me from getting close, then you may find yourself handsomely rewarded. That completes the entire list of words that make up the I love you, I hate you group. Here now is a final review of all the words mixed up a bit. Remember to fill in the definition during the pause that follows each word. Ready? The first word is revere. And whereas my friends were worshipping the popular icons of their day, the Beatles, Janis Joplin, and Bob Dylan, I had come to revere the likes of Margaret Mead, Oscar Wilde, and Isaac Asimov. To revere is to respect highly or to honor. I revere people with powerful vocabularies. Acrimonious. So do your best to please me and prevent our relationship from becoming ugly and bitter. When things grow acrimonious between myself and other people, other people always pay dearly. Acrimonious means bitter, hurtful, and nasty. The relationship between the owner and the team has long been acrimonious. Narcissism. And because I was so often content to be alone, many thought that I loved no one but myself, and I was often called narcissistic. Narcissism is a love of oneself. I have a lot of interest in other people, so it's safe to say that I am not a narcissist. Deride. In fact, if you ridicule me and deride my character too much, you might find yourself in a bit of hot water. To deride is to ridicule or laugh at contemptuously. The foolish vice president was fun to deride. Predilection. I can't really remember a time when I did not display a strong predilection towards scholarly work. A predilection is a natural preference. I have a predilection for Godiva chocolates. Rancor. On the other hand, if you're nice to me and we avoid the rancor that so often prevents people like you and me from getting close, then you may find yourself handsomely rewarded. Rancor is a bitter, long-lasting ill will or resentment. There was a great deal of rancor between the husband and wife. The divorce settlement was not going well. Confluence The writings of great thinkers from all disciplines flow together in my mind and this confluence inspired me to pursue my studies. A confluence is a flowing together. The Mississippi and the Chattahoochee rivers have a confluence somewhere in the southern United States. Antipathy. You'll find that you regret having fostered any strong feelings of dislike or antipathy between yourself and me. Antipathy is a firm dislike. Between the Hatfields and the McCoys, two long feuding families, there is a legendary antipathy. Alacrity. Unlike most of my high school friends who hated having to do schoolwork, I inevitably approached even the driest of my assignments with great eagerness and alacrity. Alacrity means a cheerful eagerness, briskness, or readiness to respond. I responded to the invitation to go to the Madonna concert with great alacrity. Bane. I live in darkness. Sunlight, which would kill me, is the bane of my existence. A bane is a torment or poison. Having to take work home with me on the weekends is the bane of my social life. Derogatory Nasty put-downs and derogatory remarks will not prevent me from having my way and doing as I will. Derogatory is disapproving or degrading. When that guy gave us the finger, it was a derogatory gesture. Affinity. I spent so much time amidst books, in fact, that my affinity for the written word became something of a campus legend. An affinity is an attraction or sympathy towards something. Birds have an affinity for the air. They love to fly. Adulation. So while my wildly admired friends who excelled at sports enjoyed the adulation of practically every student, I was reading alone in the library. Adulation is wild or excessive admiration. Rock groups regularly enjoy the adulation of their wild fans. Vilify. 
and while I am truly a messenger of evil, and I do lay waste to countless innocent victims, there is no reason to say the sorts of vile things about me that people tend to do. Do not vilify me thusly. To vilify is to say vile things about or to defame. The assault victim vilified the man she knew to be her attacker. Nihilism and after I've enjoyed the nectar from your tender, tasty veins, you'll find you've lost all faith in the goodness of mankind. You shall be a supreme nihilist, your outlook on life grim and hopeless. Nihilism is the belief that there are no morals and no goodness in the world. The nihilist, having given up all hope, finally decided to end it all. Prudent. Prudent, as we remember, means careful or having foresight. His mother claims she's prudent, or at least that's what she says when she won't let her son drive the family car. And with that, we finish the I love you, I hate you group of words. Take a look at the word spellings on the enclosed insert card. Also, see if you can come up with some mnemonic devices for those hard-to-remember words. You can base your mnemonic on any part of the word that you like. There are no rules for how to create one that works well. If the root means something to you, then use that. If not, try making a pun out of the spelling or play with the way the word sounds. Our next word group is called the naughty and the nice. We'll be dealing with words that describe people when they're being mean and when they're being pleasant. As you can probably imagine, there are plenty of words for both, so let's waste no time in getting started. We'll begin with the first half of the group, the naughty words. Our first word is belligerent. A bully is belligerent. Al was so belligerent that the meeting had the feel of a boxing match. Belligerent means combative, quarrelsome, or waging war. To be belligerent is to push other people around, to be noisy and argumentative and threatening. Belligerent is both a noun and an adjective. Sometimes one belligerent in a conflict is more belligerent than the other. And the noun belligerence, ending spelled E-N-C-E, -E, is the kind of behavior a belligerent bully would display. One way a belligerent can provoke another person is to say caustic things about them. Caustic literally means corrosive or burning like acid, as in, the caustic detergent ate right through Harry's laundry. Often, however, caustic is used figuratively to describe things people say or do to annoy one another. A caustic comment is one that is so nasty or insulting that it seems to sting or burn the person to whom it is directed. For example, the teacher's caustic criticism of Sally's term paper left her in tears. Caustic remarks are often the trademark of cynical people. For example, when the rich man gave a million dollars to the museum, cynic said he was merely trying to buy himself a reputation as a cultured person. A cynic is one who deeply distrusts human nature, one who believes humans are motivated only by selfishness. Cynicism is often used to describe a general grumpiness and pessimism about human nature. To be cynical is to be extremely suspicious of the motivation of other people. Okay, what do you call a prize fighter who is in line to win the championship? Here's a hint. Marlon Brando, on the waterfront. I could have been a... A contender? Exactly. A contender is a fighter, and to contend is to fight or argue for something. This leads us to the next word. Contentious. A person who's contentious is looking for a fight then it would follow that two people having a fight are themselves contentious. And to be contentious in a discussion is to make a lot of noisy objections. Contentious means argumentative or quarrelsome. Another word that describes general nastiness is acerbic. Not far in meaning from caustic, acerbic means bitter, sour, and severe. Here's an example. Her acerbic comment about Tom's driving ability deeply wounded his pride. Acerb and acerbic are synonyms and acerbity means bitterness. Jimmy decided a divorce was in order after his wife Jane's 10,000th acerbic remark since their wedding night. Her bitterness had ruined their marriage. Another way to ruin a relationship is to make pejorative comments. For example, you have bad breath is a pejorative remark. Pejorative means negative or disparaging. Loudmouth is a nickname with a pejorative connotation. Abe's lukewarm description of the college as a pretty good school was unintentionally pejorative. When someone sets out to deceive, then they are practicing chicanery. Political news, for example, would be dull if not for the chicanery of our elected officials. Chicanery means trickery, deceitfulness, artifice, 
especially legal or political. Try this. The Joker, Catwoman, and the Penguin all reaped millions from their clever criminal collaboration, but eventually they paid the price once their chicanery had been discovered. Yes, and their plans were particularly insidious because of the devious way they infiltrated the entire banking system. Insidious means treacherous or sneaky. The spy's insidious plan was to steal the blueprints for the new secret weapon. Winter was insidious. It crept in under the door and through the cracks in the windows. Other insidious things are the slow destruction of the environment, the decaying quality of life in the cities, and, of course, opportunistic diseases. Cancer, for instance, which can spread rapidly from a small cluster of cells, is an insidious disease. Well, this certainly has been a creepy section. I'll look forward to our moving on to the second half of this group of words. Meanwhile, however, it's time for a quick review of the vocabulary and then a character piece that uses the words in context. Quickly, then, here are the definitions of the words we just learned from the first half of naughty or nice. Belligerent. Combative, warlike, and quarrelsome. Caustic. Like acid, hurtful to the point of being corrosive. Cynic. One who deeply distrusts human nature. Pessimist. Contentious. Like a fighter, one who seeks out conflict. Acerbic. Sour, bitter, and nasty. Chicanery. Deceitful, underhanded behavior. Insidious. Treacherous and sneaky. Pejorative. Negative and disparaging. Now, stay tuned for a brief word from someone who's dying to use all these nasty words in context. Will you welcome, please, the nastiest man in the world, Mr. Misanthropy, Arthur D. Spite. Thank you. Thank you, honored members of the International Society of Pessimists, Grumps, and Cynics. It's my great pleasure to have the chance to address so many like-minded, combative, quarrelsome, belligerent people like myself. There is a treacherous, sneaky, and insidious movement out there, my friends, that would see our kind put down. But the clever, dirty tricks the underhanded chicanery of our ever-optimistic friends shall not prevail. A counter-campaign of nasty, corrosive, and caustic remarks will make mincemeat of their kindly efforts. Only the most bitter, severe, and acerbic language can effectively overthrow the current administration of happiness and hope. Go looking for arguments. Make disparaging, pejorative comments to total strangers. Pick a few fights. Be contentious. Screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. That's not a happy guy. No, not at all. Such vitriol. Vitriol? Yes, vitriol. It's technically another word for sulfuric acid, but like so many words, its more common usage is figurative. To say something vitriolic, for example, is to say something so nasty your words burn like acid. As in, the review of the book was so vitriolic that we all wondered whether the reviewer had some personal grudge against the author. His review was less an account of the book's merits, or lack thereof, than a great spewing forth of vitriol. Exactly. Vitriol. A really lovely word. What do you say we finish up by covering the other half of this group, naughty and nice, by looking at the words that mean nice. A fine idea. I'd like to start with a word that exemplifies niceness. Affable, which means relaxed and at ease in talking to others. Susan was an affable girl. She could strike up a pleasant conversation with almost anyone. To be a good egg-beater sales rep, my father used to say, you must be the picture of affability. You have to be a people person. Often a characteristic of an affable person that is to say, an outgoing, friendly, likable person, is his being gregarious. A gregarious person is a sociable one, one who enjoys the company of others. Dirk, for example, was too gregarious to enjoy the fifty years he spent in solitary confinement. Anna wasn't very gregarious. She went to the party, but she spent most of her time hiding in the closet. Furthermore, a good way to remember what gregarious means is to remember that in biology, gregarious is used to describe animals that live in groups, for instance, bees, which live together in large colonies, are said to be gregarious insects. 
It's amazing to think that a place as cramped as a beehive could provide such a congenial atmosphere. Congenial means agreeably suitable, pleasant. The little cabin in the woods was congenial to the writer. He was able to get a lot of writing done there. Don't confuse congenial with congenital, which means acquired in the womb. These two words do not mean the same thing at all. When people get along together in a restaurant and don't throw food at one another, they're being congenial. Genial and congenial share similar meanings. Genial means pleasing, kind, sympathetic, or helpful. You can be pleased by a genial manner or a genial climate. A rather strange word that connotes kindness of a very particular sort is avuncular. It literally means like an uncle, but stresses the sense of a nice uncle. Kind, helpful, generous, and understanding in an uncle-y sort of way. Avuncular can be used ironically, too. For example, one can put an avuncular face on an otherwise evil or ruthless organization. By electing a kindly old gentleman as their grand wizard, for instance, the Ku Klux Klan managed to put an avuncular face on their divisive and violent activities. They made something evil seem benign. But if someone is genuinely likable, then they can be described as amiable. For instance, Nurse David was so good-natured and amiable, even the crankiest patients smiled when he came to take their blood. Amiable means friendly and agreeable. Try this. The drama critic was so amiable in person that even the subjects of her negative reviews found it impossible not to like her. Anyone who has a working knowledge of French or Spanish has a good mnemonic for amiable. The root is clearly amy, which can mean love or friendship in either of those two Latin-based languages. Now let's talk about what you are when you're especially nice to others, to the exclusion of even your own interests. Altruism means selflessness, generosity, devotion to the interests of others. To be altruistic is to help others without expectation of personal gain. The private foundation depended on the altruism of the extremely rich old man. When he decided to start spending his money on his 18-year-old girlfriend instead, the foundation went out of business. Giving money to a charity is an act of altruism. The altruist does it just to be nice, though he'll probably remember to take a tax deduction. Now, take the root phil, which means love of, and smash it up against the root anthro, which means human. Add a simple suffix like p, that is p-y, and you get philanthropy, which of course means a love of mankind. In particular, philanthropy connotes a sense of doing good deeds, by the way, the opposite of philanthropy is misanthropy, or a hatred of humankind. A misanthropic person would never donate to a charity. Charity, for example, is a philanthropic institution. A philanthropist is someone who generally is known for being of service to other people. Philanthropy has a less heroic connotation than does altruism. Philanthropists are generous, whereas altruists risk their own best interests to serve others. And last but not least... I give you largesse. This is another word for generosity, though the nuance of its meaning is slightly different. Anyone, rich or poor, can be philanthropic, but in order to show largesse, you have to have something substantial to give. For example, Sam was marginally literate at best. Only the largesse of his powerful uncle got Sam into Princeton. Largesse can also refer to the gift itself. That's right. Largesse is usually what you use to describe a very large material gift. A millionaire who donates a wing to a hospital is exhibiting largesse. A regular person who donates what she can is being generous. Now, as you are inevitably becoming used to, we'll present a quick review of all the nice words and then follow that with a passage from a speaker who will use the words in context. Here once again are the words that signify nice. Affable. Easy to talk to. Pleasant. Gregarious. Sociable. Enjoying the company of others. Congenial. Agreeably suitable. Pleasant. Avuncular. Kindly, like an understanding uncle. Amiable. Friendly, likable. Often used to describe a relationship. Altruism. Serving others with no consideration for oneself. Philanthropy. A love of humankind and a willingness to do good deeds. Largesse. Generosity on a big scale, as well as the gift itself. And now, our speaker. Very well. It's my pleasure to present to you Gloria the Good Witch of the South by Southeast. 
Hello, hello, gentle friends. May I start by thanking my friendly, charming, amiable hosts. As a good witch with much power and many resources at my command, I am often called upon to dispense my largesse to those in need. However, my job goes beyond the mere allocation of magical assistance. I must also be upbeat, approachable, easy to talk to, and otherwise affable. Unless people feel comfortable, unless I create a relaxed, pleasant atmosphere that is congenial, they are generally unwilling to expose their need for assistance. And while it is important for me to be sociable and outgoing, I must avoid being too much of a social butterfly. Being gregarious is not part of the job description. Rather than seeming like a good buddy, I am best served by adopting a kindly, understanding, avuncular air. Whom I reward, of course, depends upon the character of those who seek my help. For example, someone who has given of himself with no regard for his own well-being, a person who has displayed that sort of altruism, is very likely to receive my favor. A simple love of mankind, a basic sense of philanthropy, is often enough to warrant my good graces. That covers all of the words in the Naughty But Nice group. Now, as we've done before, we'll present all the words one more time. Caustic A counter-campaign of nasty, corrosive, and caustic remarks will make mincemeat of their kindly efforts. Caustic means like acid, corrosive. A caustic comment is one designed to really hurt the other person. Amiable. Hello, hello, gentle friends. May I start by thanking my friendly, charming, amiable hosts. Amiable means friendly, agreeable. My favorite teacher is an amiable guy. He's great to be around. Belligerent. It's my great pleasure to have the chance to address so many like-minded, combative, quarrelsome, belligerent people like myself. Belligerent means quarrelsome and warlike. The teacher finally expelled the belligerent student from her class. Altruism. For example, someone who is given of himself with no regard for his own well-being, a person who has displayed that sort of altruism, is very likely to receive my favor. Altruism is the act of giving and expecting nothing in return. When a person runs inside a burning building to save a stranger's baby, they are being altruistic. Cynic. Thank you, thank you, honored members of the International Society of Pessimists, Grumps, and Cynics. A cynic is one who deeply distrusts human nature. They are generally very pessimistic. Dracula, for instance, is a very cynical character. Largesse. As a good witch with much power and resources at my command, I am often called upon to dispense my largesse to those in need. Largesse is the generous giving of gifts or the gift itself. The new Jones Concert Hall, named after its chief benefactor, Mr. Jones, benefited by his largesse. Acerbic. Only the most bitter, severe, and acerbic language can effectively overthrow the current administration of happiness and hope. Acerbic means bitter, sour, severe. When the divorcee described her ex-husband as a miserable little toad, she was being acerbic. Avuncular. Rather than seeming like a good buddy, I am best served by adopting a kindly, understanding, avuncular air. Avuncular means kindly in an uncly sort of way. Whenever he felt glum, little Adam would cheer himself up with a visit to the avuncular ice cream man at the corner candy store. He knew a smile and a free cone were always waiting there for him. Gregarious. And while it is important for me to be sociable and outgoing, I must avoid being too much of a social butterfly. Being gregarious is not part of the job description. Gregarious means sociable, outgoing, enjoying the company of others. A regular partygoer could be described as gregarious. Chicanery. But the clever, dirty tricks, the underhanded chicanery of our ever-optimistic friends shall not prevail. 
Chicanery is another word for trickery or deceitfulness. It usually refers to the legal or political kind. Nixon, for example, was forced to resign when his White House chicanery was discovered. Insidious. There is a treacherous, sneaky, and insidious movement out there, my friends, that would see our kind put down. Insidious means treacherous and sneaky. The slow takeover of our apartment by a silent army of cockroaches was truly insidious. Philanthropy. A simple love of mankind, a basic sense of philanthropy, is often enough to warrant my good graces. Philanthropy is a love of humankind as expressed through the doing of good deeds. The millionaires were famous for their philanthropy. They were always giving of their time and money. Contentious. Be contentious. Pick a few fights. A contentious person is quarrelsome and argumentative. High school bullies are often good examples of contentious people. Affable. I must also be upbeat, approachable, easy to talk to, and otherwise affable. Affable means easy to talk to, pleasant. An affable person is easy to get along with. Pejorative. Make disparaging or pejorative comments to total strangers. Pejorative is anything negative or disparaging. Your mother wears army boots is a pejorative thing to say. Congenial. Unless people feel comfortable, unless I create a relaxed, pleasant atmosphere that is congenial, they are generally unwilling to expose their need for assistance. Congenial means agreeably suitable or pleasant. Angela's fear of going to the dentist was eased by her doctor's congenial air and his nicely designed office. Well, that covers all.